Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today's topic is uh, about assessment and uh, treatment of uh, uh, catatonia. Uh, I uh, uh, I would urge if you can mute your mics, please. Thank you very much for that. And you can unmute at any time if you have a question and mute again. So, uh, so basically uh, let's start with the slides so catatonia what is catatonia what is the dictionary meaning of catatonia so when, when i search through the dictionary uh, are you seeing my slides or i just uh, uh, share the screen now share screen and so now you can see my screen here your sharing screen so uh, catatonia what is catatonia and what is the dictionary meaning of catatonia so when i search into the dictionary especially the dictionary.com which is one of the authentic dictionaries online at the moment so catatonia uh, in, in the dictionary means that uh, it has a meaning of down, something is down, or something is against, or something is back. So occurring originally in uh, in loan words from Greek. So basically it, is, it comes from Greek. So cataclysm, cata catalog, catalepsy, on this model, cataphil, uh, catagenesis and now we if we see catalyst like which sometimes uh, like either helps in the synthesis of molecules uh, or ions or sometimes in the breakdown of the ions so it helps catalyst a list means list means breaking down so and kata means down so uh, breaking down kata, catalyst Similarly, uh, catabolism. So when you're breaking down the products and they are disintegrating. So basically there's a concept of disintegration into it. And uh, cataplexy. So person falls down from a stroke-like condition. So plexi means kind of stroke. So he falls down. Catalepsy. Lepsy means epilepsy, kind of seizure-like condition. So person goes into a seizure-like uh, episode of posturing, so that is catalepsy. And what is the difference between catalepsy and primary posturing? We'll, we'll come to it. Catalepsy is a secondary posturing, while posturing is something primary. Otherwise, they are the same thing. So sensations and consciousness gone uh, down with rigidity. Now consciousness is usually not gone down, but sensations may. And one of the catatonic symptoms it is. But in the definition of catatonia is that you you are, I mean, it goes down to some extent. Responsiveness goes down and consciousness goes down to some extent, but you are still uh, conscious and alert uh, and not that alert. I mean, it's not something like delirium in which you there is an impaired consciousness. So in catatonia, consciousness is there, but the person is not able to express that he is conscious and he is aware of everything. And when later on he comes back to normal, he he may recall all the memories and he may say that he was in an altered state of mind and he wasn't able to. Uh, participate in any conversation or discussion. So uh, now the next one, uh, Dr. Muhammad Salman Siddiqui admit. Uh, and okay, so uh, the next uh, slide is basically, so the tone breaks down here 
the difference between from hypotonia where tone is decreased here tone is not decreased it has broken down so here in catatonia the whole system of tone is broken down and may be on an autopilot means that in some muscles it's going increased in some muscles it's being decreased and it is altered what we see in in the clinical situations so somewhere hypotonia somewhere mild hypertonia somewhere cogwheel rigidity somewhere marked rigidity even stronger than a cogwheel that you can't even move and even during the examination you may feel that one minute ago the tone was increased the next minute is decreased so it's all over the place catatonia the tone system is broken down uh, so yeah this is uh, somewhere in the uh, south of uh, pakistani punjab where the the people go to faith healers and either they uh, they get uh, so uh, admit all in the meeting yeah there are more people yeah you can uh, always you know admit people let them admit if you see any sign please uh, let them come into the meeting so this is the a slide from pa pakistan south of punjab uh, where uh, where then there are kind of pseudo faith healers i would call them pseudo faith healers because there are uh, uh, there are kind of uh, genuine faith healers as well which i i won't go into but these pseudo faith healers these are uh, what they are doing is totally unethical they're not treating the patient it's uh, and patients get and their relatives get their patients here and some of the patients i i more personally visited a couple of times and last time it was in, uh, in in 2004 and some people even get voluntarily admitted to the shades of these trees and some people are get, uh, gotten admitted by these uh, their their families on an, a kind of involuntary uh, basis so but what our professor sahib uh, professor saad malik He's retired now and a big name in psychiatry. So what he did in 1990s, he started treating those people because they were getting no benefit. So at least with the sincere attention. So we, like uh, our team of the Mind Camp organization, Pakistan, Lahore, they, they go every three months there and they have a resident uh, a medical officer uh, uh, kind of uh, who is who lives locally and who uh, visits those people uh, regularly on a daily or a weekly basis and then uh, monitors their progress and then the team from Lahore comes every three months and monitor their progress and they are given injections and the good thing is that they are not here forever which was the case before 1990s that they they do get discharged eventually because they get the uh, depot medication and along with procyclidine so we also uh, treat the treat the symptoms it's not only that we are treating the psychosis we treat the patient as a whole with the depot and the uh, procyclidine and, and and if there is any mood stabilizer required so this patient you can see here like his posture so most likely the way he's so flat it's unlikely that it is only extra pyramidal symptoms looks like catatonia to me or it could be a mixture of catatonia and extra pyramidal symptoms but look at his we can't see his eyes but look at his posture and the doctors the team of doctors and his relatives they are all looking at him and look at his response so and uh, when i personally visited this place and almost the same location 
uh, I, I saw a person and I felt very uh, sorry for him that uh, the person was standing on one leg for ages, for hours and hours. And I mean, if we start, if we lift our one leg and we cannot, you know, sustain it for, for a long period of time, but he was. So that's how catatonic patients and, and thankfully, thank God that they are now treated at least. Of course, Professor Sapp tried his best to, to, to make some kind of, you know, to break this vicious circle, but the people who are running the shrine were very influential. So that's a sidewise discussion. And let's go to the next one. So, so classification of the catatonia. So, uh, so in DSM-5, I would mainly go through the DSM-5, at least uh, with the criteria, because that is more up to date at the moment. And I will mention briefly where they classify in the ICD-10 without going into the criteria. So classified in the DSM-5, uh, it is 293.89, wherever catatonia occurs, whether it is in schizophrenia, whether it's in depression, bipolar, malignant catatonia, you put an additional code of F, uh, so not F, but, uh, uh, 293.89 uh, and and then you maintain the primary condition and in addition you do the secondary condition as well. Welcome Zuhayb Gul. So, uh, so basically uh, kind of, so schizophrenia is there, for example, ICD-10, F20 and then you add the code 293.89 catatonia associated with another mental disorder or they also endorse the icd-10 organic code because catatonia on its own is mentioned uh, at one place in icd-10 which is independent of cause and that is organic catatonia and the dsm-5 kind of abolishes the distinguish, uh, this, uh, uh, like distinction between the organic and functional, and they say that everything has an organic basis. So therefore they have taken the organic code from ICD-10 F06.1. Now the same code will come even if it is due to another medical condition or even if it is unspecified catatonia. So the code will uh, remain the same. Now, classification uh, ICD-10. So as I said, F06.1 is organic catatonic disorder. That's a separate entity. But there are mixed entities in, inside the ICD-10. For example, F20.2 F20 is a subtype of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, so that is catatonic schizophrenia. DSM-5 doesn't endorse any subtypes, but uh, they say that uh, it is uh, kind of uh, like it, it is there. So as a separate entity. So similarly, depressive stupor, dissociative stupor, they are in the ICD-10. And there are some other things for example, manic stupor, this is not in ICD-10, but when we come any another mental disorder, bipolar affective disorder also comes. So manic stupor, uh, uh, although not mentioned specifically, but uh, manic stupor means that uh, a person, it's some kind of mixed affective state, that your psychomotor activity is nil, but when it goes to the mind, and I've seen one patient in Pakistan when uh, around uh, uh, 2001, two, that the patient inside his brain, he was full of psychic energy. But when it comes to the physical energy, psychomotor energy, there was none. So he wasn't able to uh, express his, uh, like express himself in terms of motor energy. So he was bed bound. 
but when you see it, his facial expression, that was showing that he was full of energy and full of thoughts, and he wasn't able to uh, express all this. So that is a, a kind of uh, the manic stupor. And go, going back to the slides now. So conditions where catatonia may exist, DSM-5. So autistic spectrum disorder. And uh, so somebody was asking uh, kind of uh, autism spectrum, like uh, whether it can occur in neurodevelopmental disorder, like Anas was asking. So yes, it can. And even DSM-5 relates the two, autism spectrum disorder along with other neurodevelopmental disorders. But you have to put a separate code. For example, autism, autism spectrum disorder, uh, 299, and then uh, the uh, F84 uh, uh, is the same, and then 293.89, F06.1. One is from DSM, one is from ICD-10CM, uh, which is ICD and clinically modified according to the usage in America and Canada, especially the United States. Because they, it's an international, they're international codes. APA codes are local, while the ICD-10 codes are international, and they are still used in, in, in the United States of America and even Canada, I think, for the billing purposes. Mm. Now, please mute, mute your mic if you can. So bipolar affective disorder, I've already told you what manic stupor is, and depressive disorder or psychotic, like in ICD-10, it will be a severe depressive episode or a recurrent depressive disorder, current episode severe with psychotic symptoms. So stupor or catatonia in itself is a kind of psychotic or almost psychotic symptom and you treat it as a psychosis although the treatment may include benzodiazepines mainly but it is it is a kind of uh, psychotic symptom sometimes you have to use the antipsychotics so schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorder for example brief psychotic disorder schizophreniform disorder and uh, and uh, a kind of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and the other conditions which are uh, dissociative catatonia. So dissociative stupor when, you, when we come to the ICD-10, it is mentioned there. Now, due to any other med medical condition, hepatic encephalopathy. Now what DSM-5 says is don't attribute it just to delirium or the course of delirium. But when you know the cause of the delirium, you may attribute uh, catatonia to the real cause of delirium. For example, hepatic encephalopathy, neurological conditions, infection, metabolic disorder. Now, medication-induced, yes, it can be medication-induced. Now, it is the psychological pillow, which, will, which I will show you in the next slides. So, and you have to differentiate it with the neck dystonia. For example, if you have given haloperidol and the neck becomes stiff, uh, so the neck becomes stiff and uh, and, and that is the neck dystonia. Uh, sometimes the eyes also get rolled up, and that is oculogyric crisis. So in the psychological pillow, it is a primary condition. So that means if it is a primary condition, that means that uh, you haven't given any antipsychotic and it's happening. So I saw one patient of psychological pillow, but we couldn't say it with surety, and that was in the Services Institute of Medical Science, uh, Services Hospital Lahore in 2002, when uh, uh, Dr. Shahid Amit Waris, he showed me, I was a, a senior house officer at that time, so he showed me, it's a psychological pillow. And then he said, look what, we have given him Melril, which is 
thioridazine, a traditional antipsychotic, which is now banned. It's like chlorpromazine, but it's banned now because of the QTC prolongation. So at that time, it was still, you know, there were last days of uh, thioridazine when we used it. And, and uh, Dr. Shahid said that this kind of psychological pillow we are seeing is due to thioridazine. So we can't say this with surety. Now, medication-induced movements or other uh, adverse effects of medication. So sometimes medications can cause. So even if it was, it could be a medication-induced psychological pillow or otherwise neck dystonia. In context of neuroleptic malignant disorder or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, so NMS, that's a big differential diagnosis of uh, with the uh, catatonia and malignant catatonia. And uh, I mean, the diagnosis is very similar, uh, apart from, uh, especially with the malignant catatonia, they're uh, almost like very, very similar, if not identical, they're very similar symptoms. And it's the medication causing that and the chronicity, temporal relationship with the medication you establish in the uh, malignant, uh, like in the NMS versus uh, malignant catatonia, it will be something really uh, primary. And again, the, the treatment may differ. So that is uh, where uh, the catatonia may exist as a differential diagnosis of malignant catatonia uh, and NMS. Medical causes, so of catatonia, so we have uh, gone through the psychiatric causes, the other medical causes, uh, dementia may be one, and uh, then the uh, drug induced, and uh, there could be other, for example, the much sleep prescribing uh, guidelines, they say infections, drug withdrawal, and toxic drug states, which can induce catatonia. Uh, hepatic encephalopathy, subarachnoid hemorrhage, basal ganglia disorders, non-convulsive status epilepticus, locked in an akinetic mutism states, uh, endocrine and metabolic disorders, Wilson's disease, Prader-Willi syndrome, autophospholipid syndrome, and SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. So catatonia associated with another mental disorder. So fulfill the criteria of uh, uh, that mental disorder. Now we are, we are coming to the DSM-5 criteria. And we'll, we're still not going into the symptoms, but we are going into the criteria. So fulfill the cri catatonia specifier criteria, which is laid down in the section A. And uh, section A, what is that there are 12 symptoms, which we'll go through in detail. Out of those, 12 symptoms, there are three symptoms you have to, you have to fulfill the criteria of. And then uh, C, D, and E, if, if it is due to a medical condition. So basically, you just, please mute your mic. Thank you. Excuse me, please, mics mute karte apne apne. So, uh, so then a full list of 12 symptoms such as catalepsy and vaccine flexibility and there is a mental disorder and, and that's it. That's enough for the mental catatonia due to the mental disorder. But when it comes to, because mental disorder, criteria of mental disorder fulfilling is is a big criteria in itself there should be like schizophrenia one month uh, history at least and then uh, and, and and then all the symptoms that negative symptoms uh, and uh, kind of social decline or so or affect uh, affect on the effect on the social functioning psychosocial functioning all these things are there in the yeah, in the schizophrenia. So you first cri uh, fulfill the criteria of mental disorder and you add at least three out of 12 symptoms of the catatonia and that is, that's it. But when it comes to the medical condition, 
you the criteria is a bit dif different. First of all, this condition is gone. Fulfill, fulfill the criteria of the mental disorder because it's not due to a mental disorder now. It is due to a medical disorder. And so you go through the pool list of 12 symptoms and you see at least three are there. Because the symptoms are so severe that even only three are enough. So generally, we in any disorder, we go for at least 50% of symptoms. But here, only one-fourth are enough. So then you go through that there's the evidence of history, physical examination, lab findings, that it is the direct pathophysiological consequence of another medical condition. And that's why DSM says that don't say that it's due to delirium. You have to specify the cause of delirium, then attribute to the cause, whatever cause it may be. This disturbance is not better explained by another mental disorder. That's what they are saying. Disturbance does not occur exclusively during the course of a delirium. So that's what they are saying that you, you cannot ex, uh, just attribute it to delirium, but you can attribute it to the cause and then go for it. And then disturbance causes clinically significant distress and impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of function. So mechanism of catatonia. So we don't know, but I think uh, the uh, like the medic, uh, Maudsley prescribing guidelines and other uh, authors they they say uh, that it is the top-down modulation of basal ganglia due to the de, uh, deficiency uh, uh, or uh, like cortical GABA. There is a deficiency in the uh, cortical gamma amino butyric acid. So GABA uh, amino, uh, like the uh, like there is a deficiency of GABA in the basal ganglia. That's one thing. And there are other is uh, other things that block it. Sudden and massive. Uh, very, uh, I say very welcome to my respected uh, teacher, Professor Rubin Aslam, who is the head of the Department of uh, Psychiatry at uh, Alama Iqbal Medical College. Very welcome, madam. So, uh, so draw top down modulation of uh, basal ganglia uh, due to deficiency of uh, cortical GABA. And the other is blockade of dopamine. And the other is clozapine withdrawal catatonia. That's also one of the recognized causes, that cholinergic and serotonergic rebound hyperactivity. And then there could be chronic catatonia uh, because of the abnormalities in metabolism bilaterally in thalamus and frontal lobes. So now the main thing of, the, of today the pooled list of uh, 12 symptoms, at least uh, three should be there. So I will just enumerate the symptoms first. Stupor, catalepsy, waxy flexibility, mutism, negativism, posturing, mannerism, stereotypy, agitation, grimacing, echolalia, and uh, echopraxia. So now we come to the first term, which is stupor. Now in the medicine, stupor is something different. Stupor is a pre-comatose stage where in, there is a definite impairment of consciousness. Here, there is no definite impairment of consciousness. So that means that, uh, so, the, it, uh, so the patient is, alert inside, although he may be irresponsive, but he's generally alert in their own mind. They cannot express because their mental state is so impaired. There's no psychomotor activity and not actively relating to environment, complete lack of motor responses. And, if, and it's often uh, associated with mutism which is verbal responses are also lacked most of the times. So 
immobility plus mutism, but mutism is a separate thing which complicates the stupor. So we'll come to mutism later on. Severe motor Im immobility is there. So, uh, and the causes of the stupor now is uh, de depressive stupor, dissociative stupor, stupor in psychosis. Stupor is uh, what DSM says is that it's the classic and most striking catatonic sign. It's a combination of immobility and mutism, although the two can also occur independently. Patient can be mute, but not be uh, not having stupor. And the patient may be having stupor and not mute, or may be partially mute, maybe saying a couple of sentences, but not fully mute. I've seen patients like that. So lack of psychomotor activity, which may range from not actively relating to the environment to complete immobility. And that's where the Bush Francis catatonia rating scale uh, comes, which tells you that what state it is the patient is in. Now the next is catalepsy. Now catalepsy is a secondary posturing or it's a passive posturing, means that you are putting patient into a posture. The examiner himself is putting the patient into a posture and the patient is continuing to to that into that posture. So the patient is uh, like he will sustain or he will maintain that posture, but primarily it was induced. So there, that's the hairline difference with the posturing and many authors, they say that they are uh, synonyms, but I, I was able to kind of differentiate between the two and that's why I'm describing it. So, uh, so that's, uh, so posturing is a spontaneous acqu uh, acquisition of a poster while catalepsy is something secondary. What's the flexibility? is that when you uh, lift the patient's arm and you feel slight resistance, that is waxy flexibility. And when, and as a result, the patient may acquire a posture. And what posture they acquire, whatever posture, that is called uh, catalepsy. So catalepsy is the maintaining of the posture by the patient while checking for flex, waxy flexibility. Now, this is a, a kind of a copyrighted slide. So it's uh, from Nakashmandi uh, MD. So that's what they said. They're differentiating it from uh, cataplexy versus catalepsy. So cataplexy is, we generally see in narcolepsy. The patient was standing, suddenly they get an attack of narcolepsy or they get huge ex uh, emotions in their mind and they fall down hypotonia and patient falls down again kata means down here so patient is falling down and the the author of the picture he makes a makes uh, an x sign so because the patient has gone down and uh, and you can see an x like the uh, upper limbs and the lower limb position that makes an X. While catalepsy, the patient makes an L position. So that is catalepsy. That means that you raised patient's leg or arm and they sustain that posture. That is catalepsy. Now, so the next term is waxy flexibility. So I always give the example of a table lamp or a microphone, you can see a flexible microphone. So when you move this lamp, you feel slight resistance and it, it is a slight resistance. It cannot be, otherwise, you know, it will be very difficult to adjust the mic if the resistance is huge or if it is extremely rigid. So there's a slight resistance here or here you feel and that resistance 
it's the same kind of resistance you feel in the patient's arm, and that is called Wexi flexibility. And as a result, in the end, the lamp acquires a posture. So that is the posture, and the posture they have acquired is called catalepsy. Okay, and yeah, I have a video to show now. It's a two-minute video. Once a patient has rigidity and stupor, we have to make sure about what is called waxy flexibility. It indicates schizophrenic illness. What is waxy flexibility? We mold the arm of the patient slowly in an awkward position for a while. There is no much resistance. He's so flexible like wax and we keep it in the same way. Thank you. So here you are seeing now is catalepsy. And what the examiner did earlier on. This is what the examiner is doing his vexy flexibility performing. And he's feeling the vexy no flexibility. And now what is so what happens as a result like is wax. Catalepsy. And we keep it in the same position and we see. In normal people, they retain the hand or the arm immediately. And such a patient see what will happen. And uh, like in, in the start of my career in 2001, Professor Saad Bashir Malik, what he taught was is that, okay, I'm going to raise your hand. You can bring it back if you like. That was the command given by Professor Sahib. So, and, and the patient doesn't because he was given the option and he doesn't. And that clearly shows that he is having this posturing or catalepsy in the end. And here he's slowly bringing down. Gradually, he is returning his arm to the same position or the normal position. So most likely, this patient has what we call catatonic schizophrenia. He's in a condition called catatonic stupor. The cause of it is schizophrenia. So that's what uh, Dr. Sugay said that uh, the cause of this rigidity is, in this case, is schizophrenia. It could be due to any cause, but in this case, it is most likely schizophrenia because he has patient chart in, uh, in front of him and he knows that the patient has a history of schizophrenia. Now, the mutism. So the mutism is maybe no or very little verbal response verbally unresponsive or minimally unresponsive or minimally responsive. So that means that mutism patient is saying a word or two or maybe nodding their head in yes or no or saying yes or no. That's it. So that's the mutism. And it's often uh, kind of uh, seen along with the stupor. Uh, but differentiate it with the aphasia so it's not the same as aphasia in aphasia the patient cannot uh, cannot communicate cannot say anything uh, as a part of cortical dysfunction so it's slightly different from that uh, now negativism negativism and jejun halt and they are the two terms so negativism means that you give a command to the patient and the patient does opposite or you try to establish a movement in the patient 
and the patient does the opposite. You're trying to flex the patient's arm and patient resists. And when you leave the arm, he rather extends it. So he's done opposite to that. Or if you ask the patient, take my hand, which is shown in Newcastle University video later on, that you, you ask the patient to, uh, you ask the patient to kind of uh, take my hand and when they try to take your hand, they, they cannot. So they, they rather, they will do the opposite. Or you, you say, do not take my hand, they will do the opposite and they will take. That also in a way shows frontal lobe symptom as well, disinhibition. So the related concept is judge and halt. And, and as the word you see halt, halt means to stop something. So the patient is trying to halt your movement, to resist the movement. The resistance the patient is showing is called Jejen Halton. So in negativism, the patient resists the movements and does the opposite. And in Jejen Halton, the patient will resist the movement strongly. And it will not be something, a mild resistance that you feel in flexibility. You really feel rigidity and the active resistance. And the patient may not be aware of that because it's it's a kind of in catatonic. And what the DSM says is the resistance offered is exactly equal to the strength applied. So in waxy flexibility here, the resistance was not equal. Your arms are kind of much more stronger than this uh, this waxy arm of the mic. But here the resistance will be equal. That's the difference. So posturing, posturing, as I said, it's a spontaneous and active maintenance of a posture against the gravity. So this is the one you can see here, psychological pillow, or here is the typical classical posturing. And there are more examples of posturing here. And then the mannerisms. So they are, kind of uh, normal people, they're not patients' pictures, but it's just to show. So mannerism is something which, apparent, which is apparently purposeful, like saluting or rubbing their mouth or rubbing their nose, buttoning up shirt, combing, uh, or, 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 or uh, touching their pocket or touching their chest again and again, hopping, so these things which are apparently purposeful. Stereotypy. So the eighth is stereotypy. Stereotypy are regular movements, but unlike mannerism, like in mannerism, they were some purposeful and the purpose was something really positive. Like if you are saluting, you, you may salute positively any person uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And similarly, but here in stereotypy, you you are observing the movement so there are regular movements uh, but they are not uh, goal directed they're not purposeful and if they are purposeful even the purpose is doesn't make sense for example rocking repetitively or non-goal directed movements uh, handshaking or waving, body rocking, head banging, self biting. So there is a negative purpose involved, self harm. So even then we will we'll call it as stereotypy. So if there is an aimless repetition of some words or phrases, it's also called verbigeration. Or some people say it's a kind of verbal per perseveration, but I will come to the difference between uh, what's the difference between verbigeration and perseveration or verbal perseveration? So this is kind of stereotypic movements. If the patient is trying to bite their nails, self-hitting, waving, mouthing of objects, picking skin, nail biting, and so on. Uh, now the next term we have is uh, catatonic excitement. So I have seen a couple of patients, especially one patient out of, like we were in the ward round that was in the Republic of Ireland. And we were in the ward round and the patient suddenly 
suddenly lifts up from the chair and goes, bangs the door and comes back. And when you ask him, he's totally unresponsive. He's not even communicating, he's mute. Or the patient all of a sudden may hit the examiner or any of the doctors or nurses sitting there. And later on, he has no insight. He doesn't even know what he's doing. That is kind of catatonic excitement or, or, or aggression. Could be fidgeting, restlessness, facing around, or even hitting. It can be extremely hyperactive. And it, he was so hyperactive at one stage that we had to, we had no choice but to put him into seclusion. Although he was, when, when we see kind of, he was one of the most pleasant persons you will ever meet in your life, when you see him in the real life. But when it comes to his catatonic state, you know, you, you just see that he was in a full catatonic excitement and he didn't know what he was doing. So he may experience delusions or hallucinations, may fluctuate between stupor and excitement. So catatonia, there is a fluctuation between hypertonia, hypotonia, waxy flexibility. Similarly, there could be a fluctuation between stupor and excitement, which are two opposite terms. So again, catatonic excitement, agitation could be there, impulsivity is there, and I've already given you the example, patient lifting up from the chair and banging the door or hitting somebody without provocation, or, and he can't give any uh, kind of uh, explanation. Combativeness is also a kind of catatonic excitement, aggression, undirected manner without explanation. Now grimacing. So grimacing is odd facial expression, usually of a disgust. Can be any odd facial expression, but they are usually for pain, disgust, or disapproval. And that is a catatonic symptom. And this is just a slide for your laughter. And uh, aquilalia. So the 11th of the term is aquilalia means that the patient repeats what the examiner is saying. So it is always good to do a full neurological examination and the examination of extra pyramidal symptoms, and you will elicit many things out of it. So you will elicit kind of hypertonia, hypotonia, or all the catatonic symptoms you can elicit while examining for EPSEs and neurological examination. So if you ask the patient in a neurological examination, uh, I'm trying to move your arm and, uh, uh, and you try to push my arm. So I'm, I'm pushing your arm, you try to push my arm. For example, checking the flexion in the elbow or you resist it. And the patient without, patient will not do it whether, or rather the patient was saying, I am going to, uh, I am going to uh, pull your arm up and I'm going to push your arm now. So you will say the same thing what examiner has uh, said earlier on, and he will not act on the command, whether just like a parrot, repetition like a parrot, that's the uh, example. Now related concepts, verbigeration, Again, verbigeration, it is the non-purposeful uh, phrase. In legoclonia, uh, it is syllables. And if the patient uh, says, repeat words, the only words, not phrases, then it is pallidalia. Now, all these can occur in form of verbal perseveration as well. The difference between the verbigeration and perseveration or... Hello, can everybody hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, where, where did it break? Can you tell me the last thing I said? I'll share screen now uh, here. And before I think I... I before the sharing, I would start the record. Yeah, it is recording now. So, uh, acolalia, okay. 
So we broke at Aquilalia. I will go back to the uh, Aquilalia here. So yeah, Aquilalia means repetition like a parrot, purposeless repetition. And if if you if you say to a parrot, eat your food, the parrot will not eat his food, but it will say, eat your food. You, you will say, David, he will say, David. So in the same way, and also our toddlers, our children who are learning to you know, speak, they also exhibit that. Autistic children, unfortunately, exhibit that up till a later age seven, 11, or even in their teenagers, sometimes they exhibit echolalia. But a toddler would exhibit, ladia as a, uh, uh, exhibit echolalia as a way of learning that they have to repeat. And that's how they have no shame and nothing. And that's the way they, they learn a lot and they learn the language within a year. So that is echolalia, mimicking or imitating. So if you say that to the examiner, lift your arm, uh, exa uh, the examiner says to the patient, lift your arm, and the patient doesn't lift their arm. Rather, uh, rather the patient says that, uh, the patient says uh, that, uh, a, a kind of, patient also says, lift your arm. Patient says, put down your, uh, examiner says, put down your arm. Patient also says, put down your arm. So what I was saying is, to elicit these things, do a full neurological examination and extra parameters examination, and rather a full physical examination. Because when it, when it comes to malignant catatonia, hepatic encephalopathy, you have to see other things. So do a full neurological and physical examination, and you will elicit many symptoms of catatonia while doing that. So verbigeration. Verbigeration, logoclon logo, logoclonia, and pallilalia. They are three, three different words. So verbigeration is patient is saying the same sentence again and again. The Mars is surrounding the Earth. The Earth is surrounding the Mars. So the patient is spontaneously saying. We don't know where it comes from, but the patient, what you see, to, to you, it sounds quite spontaneous. The patient is saying spontaneously. So that is called verbigeration. And the next is, uh, so uh, it's kind of a random sentence, which doesn't make uh, much sense. If there are syllables like a, uh, b, the, so they are, this is called logo, logoclonia. If there are words, pallilalia, for example, if the patient is saying moon, 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 that is pallilalia. Now, all of this would be called verbal perseveration if the, in the first time it was something really uh, purposeful. In the first go, if it was purposeful, then you will call it perseveration. So, perseveration, verbal perseveration with, verb, uh, with verbigeration or verbal perseveration with, uh, uh, of a logoclonic type, or verbal perseveration of a palilalic type. So verbal perseveration, the first time it has to be uh, very much purposeful. And the best example which comes to my mind when I was doing my medicine internship in the year 2000, when I graduated, so in the one of our patients with hepatic encephalopathy and the DSM-5 and the other, they have mentioned hepatic encephalopathy uh, as one of the signs of, of the causes of uh, catatonia now. So one of the patients was saying in Punjabi, Pisha ho, Pisha ho means go away, go away, go away. And his relatives and the doctors and nurses were trying to curtail him. And what you f see, the agitation, it's a catatonic excitement you see in the hepatic encephalopathy. And to curtail that, to counter that, they were trying to uh, kind of uh, put minimal restrictions on his mobility. And restrictions were in place after all. He was moved into uh, a side room in isolation and after a few days he died. But I remember 
you know, I was, he, he came to our ward and, and we, we, were, we were seeing him throughout in the next few days. And even in the side room for many days, his perseveration was Pishan Ho, Pishan Ho, go away, go away. Although there was nobody around. And that is called perseveration. In the first st stance, it was purposeful. And now the people, the, the doctors who were not on the duty in the A and E that day, they may not know that it was purposeful, but I was the witness and I followed that later on. So that is called perseveration that initially relative, initially purposeful, but later become irrelevant. Now, echopraxia is the motor equivalent of echolalia. The patient does whatever the examiner do, does. So the patient, the examiner, if you put two pens on the table and you put one pen, the patient would, will take the other pen. You start writing, the patient will also start writing. And here are the two twins who are reading the, uh, the kind of uh, the newspaper at the same time, or two girls, two sisters enjoying with each other, or uh, brother and sister, they're uh, pulling out their uh, tongue. So this is kind of echopraxia doing, the, doing this same thing. These are the 12 terms, and out of these 12, you have to fulfill at least any three of those. And then you can say there's a catatonia. And then you establish the cause, whether it is due to an established mental disorder or an established medical disorder. Okay. And uh, uh, then the other terms which are not in diagnostic criteria. So these were the core terms. Now we come to the other terms. And sorry, it's taking a long, but I, I, I want to finish it today. I think we have just 15 slides left. Most of the, that we have covered. Ambitendency. So it's a kind of, you know, it's closer to catatonic excitement. So, uh, but in this ambitendency or kind of ambivalence, patient moves out and in of the doorstep or does, or when he asks to shake the hands, it's seen in schizophrenia, and that's a catatonic symptom. Patient will take hand or extends or withdraws the hand repeatedly. So resistance to and cooperation. The patient is kind of resisting and cooperating at the same time. Tazabzub, uska urdu mein jo tarjuma hoga, right? Tazabzub ka shikar ho gaya patient. So kashma kash ka shikar hai. That is ambivalence, or in technical terms, it is called ambitendency. Aversion. The patient turns away from the examiner when addressed. So you ask the patient to sit down, and he moves away. That is aversion. And I have seen, and it, it's uh, seen this, sometimes purposeful and sometimes out of catatonia. Logoria. Logoria is kind of incessant, incoherent, and usually monotonous speech. Kind of it's an equivalent to word salad in schizophrenia. So pressure of speech, there is a pressure of speech, but it's like word salad. Like you can't make out anything he's saying. Forced grasping. So uh, yeah, one of the thing is check the grasp reflex or even ask the patient to shake hand. The grasp reflex is when you touch the patient's hand and they grasp. And here, even if you say forced grasping, even if you say that, take my hand, they will take it and they will grasp it very forcefully. So there are two related concepts. And both may be there in the, as a sign of catatonia. Other terms, uh, Patient stops suddenly in the course of a movement and is generally unable to give a reason. This appears to be a motor counterpart of thought block. For example, I uh, stop share. And I show you, for example, uh, now somebody asked me to uh, to to touch my uh, like a finger nose test to, to touch my nose. So. I'm touching my nose, 
and this is the normal. But here, it may, I'm touching my nose, and I stop here. So thought block. So similar thing here, happening here. Or touch the patient, or touch the examiner's, uh, touch the examiner's hand. So I, I just stop here. Normally I have to go there, but I stop here. So that's like a thought block. And this kind of thought block equivalent uh, is there and it's called uh, obstruction. So share screen again. And click on this share. So hope you're seeing this screen again. So automatic obedience. Patient demonstrates exaggerated cooperation automatically obeying every instruction of the examiner. So verbal, verbal instructions, it is automatic obedience. And there are two subtypes or there are two closely knitted concepts, Mitmachen and Mitjehen. So in Mitmachen or Mitmachen, you, the body of the patient can be put into any posture even if the patient is given instructions to resist. In waxy flexibility, you are asking that they can bring it back. Here, you are saying resist, and they're not resisting. That is mitmaken. So it's a closer concept to waxy flexibility. Automatic obedience means that you have, like you have given a verbal command, and they're obeying. Mitmaken is that you are trying to move, and they are showing full cooperation, even if those you're saying that uh, resist. And mitjehan is the extreme of mitmachen or mitmaken, that extreme of automatic obedience in which the examiner is able to move the patient's body with the slightest touch, but the body part immediately returns to the original position, unlike in waxy flexibility. So here in, in mitjehan, kind of uh, the examiner is able to move the patient's body with the slightest touch. So I, I show you again, for example, uh, stop share the screen and I show you, I, I touch my own hand and it goes like that. I slight a very slight pressure and then comes back to normal. That's uh, mid -gen. Or mid -making will be something that I'm putting, I'm asking the patient to resist. I'm moving your arm, please put, resist as much as you can. And the patient is not showing any resistance. Despite saying that is a uh, kind of mit -making. So, uh, and here, the share the screen again, screen share. Now, uh, so there are two kinds of automatic obedience, other signs, now, malignant catatonia is a subtype of catatonia, and every catatonia, it's very important to do a full physical examination. So in, in addition to prominent catatonic signs, the patient exhibits hyperpyrexia, clouding of consciousness, autonomic instability, the same things you are seeing in neuroleptic malignant syndrome you can see in malignant catatonia without giving any antipsychotic and the diagnosis will be the same only the treatment will slightly differ so a diagnosis of lethal or malignant catatonia should be considered and it is lethal nms can be life threatening malignant catatonia can also be life threatening so you need to treat it aggressively and with the involvement of medics, not on your own. So other signs of catatonia, rigidity, rigid position, despite efforts to be moved, altered tone, hypotonia, hypertonia, which is not mentioned, but you know, but that's what you see. So you are checking the tone. Some sometimes it is hypertonia, uh, sometimes it is hypotonia and sometimes it's normal tone and or somewhere so in the upper limbs there could be uh, hypotonia in the lower limbs there could be hypertonia or vice versa 
and could be cogwheel rigidity. Withdrawal. Yeah, withdrawal is, again, it's life-threatening and it can happen in normal catatonia or in malignant catatonia. Refusal to eat, drink, or make eye contact. And this is, again, even if it is not a malignant catatonia, this refusal to eat and drink can be life-threatening and we see it very commonly in catatonia, in severe catatonic schizophrenia or depressive stupor or other causes of catatonia. So types of catatonia, again, there are just two types, malignant or non-malignant. Severe, lethal means malignant, or non-lethal, non-severe, or at least non-lethal, non-life-threatening is non-malignant. And if there are autonomic or NMS-like symptoms, this is called uh, malignant catatonia. I will just uh, go through the uh, catatonic, like this Bush-Francis catatonia rating scale, and uh, let's open it. So, uh, copy and just go to here and met calc here. I will show you metcalc.com, Bush Francis Catatonia rating scale. So this is the online version and there are uh, PDF versions. I think it, and they're not showing this or we can try the other one. For example, uh, going back here and try this one. So this is the original one and this is the text version of the same. So let's go through this. This is a slightly modified version. Allow. So you can see there are kind of 23 symptoms and there could be 69 marks. And if you fulfill the three symptoms as in DSM-4 or DSM-5, you can make the diagnosis. But you have to diagnose according to the DSM-5 or ICD-10 or ICD-11. So screening score 1 to 14 is that they screen positive. They are screening positive, then you go through the checklist of the DSM-5 and then diagnose. Uh, and if the severity score, it is more than kind of 14, that means that, uh, that uh, like uh, if they are severe enough, uh, then uh, that means that they are probably fulfilling the criteria of DSM-5. You have to fulfill the criteria in any case. But if they are scoring above 23 or above uh, kind of 14 items, uh, like let's say if, if they are, so this is all means severity. Bush francis catatonia rating scale is the severity. It's not diagnosis. So it could be one to 14 items here. There are items out of 23, or the score you have to multiply by 3, 42, or 1 to 23 will be the severity score. So that means if you, you are putting the score, it will be out of 69. So they're all kind of uh, 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 like you're measuring the your screening as well as the measuring the severity. And uh, and here I will show you here now, and we'll skip it when it comes to later on. So what I said earlier is do the whole physical examination, neurological, EPSCs, and other general physical and the systemic examination. So observe the patient while trying to engage in a conversation activity level, and then examiner stretches head in an exaggerated manner, echopraxia, examine the arm for cogwheeling, Negativism, waxy flexibility can be established and ask the patient to extend the arm or say, do not let me raise your arm. That will tell you about the resistance or obstruction or passive obedience. Similarly, motorically stuck, do not shake my hand when you say. And similarly, automatic obedience, grasp reflex, check for grasp reflex or, or shake hand, both will uh, tell you about the grasp reflex. 
and most importantly, eight and nine, check patient's vitals, temperature and pulse and respiratory rate, blood pressure, and look for autonomic instability and abnormal vital signs. And observe the patient, they're eating, they're drinking, at least for a brief period every day. So here we come back to the slides now. So I've explained to you. And so you have to take a collateral history from the nursing staff, as well as uh, you do the examiner, uh, like you do, you examine the patient as below and doing the full examination. Now it's uh, about five to six minute or three minute video. Let's put it on. So this is the Newcastle Castle University Castle. video. So they're role players here. It's not a real patient, but they're role player. But they will explain to you how they have elicited everything. That's the grasp reflex you're seeing. If there's a clear negative, don't shake my hand. And patient is still shaking hand and retaining grasp as well. And now look at the perseveration. Patient has still in the, and the posturing, patient is still in the same position. He's repeating the same command, negativism, and he's still shaking the hand. So, now they, they are eliciting the waxy flexibility. Again, have you seen the King South video, same way. This is waxy flexibility, what the examiner is doing right now. Now, as a result, the posture which is established by the patient is called catalepsy. This is now you are seeing is catalepsy or secondary posturing. Opposition. Now the patient is resisting to the movement. Jej and Halton or closely knitted concept with negativism or opposition. The classic negativism was when he did the opposite. The examiner asked him not to shake hand and he did. And here it is Jej and Halton or resistance. And this is negativism, including aversion. So the first was Jej and Halton, and now it is negativism. Including aversion means going away from the examiner. So he's asking to shake the hand, and the patient is turning a hand away from the examiner. This is negativism and this is aversion. Okay, and they're all pseudo patients. There's no real patient in this clip. So let's go back to these slides. 
I hope you are still with me. And the next is differential diagnosis of catatonia or the causes of catatonia. Schizophrenia, depression, mania, as I explained earlier, manic stupor is an entity. And I've seen one patient in Pakistan years ago. Organic disorders, infections, epilepsy, metabolic disorder, you know, the medical causes, the drugs, so recreational drugs, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome can be a differential diagnosis uh, rather than cause. And hysteria or dissociative stupor or dissociative catatonia, uh, psychogenic catatonia. Sometimes they go into the trismus, for example, locking their jaw very forcefully. And this is, this can happen in dissociative catatonia or idiopathic or catatonia unspecified. But the, again, the term will be uh, the same as to, to 89.93 or vice versa, 293.89. So now the investigations for a patient presenting with catatonia. Now for every patient do full blood count and look for white cell count because of the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Because white cell will be count, will be raised both in NMS and malignant catatonia. Similarly, renal function tests, both NMS and malignant catatonia can cause renal failure or respiratory failure because of the muscle tension. Liver function tests to rule out the hepatic encephalopathy, thyroid function tests, blood glucose, CPK, or in the UK and Ireland, we call it CK, creatinine kinase. So it's a must do in both malignant catatonia or any catatonia, because you have to establish it's not malignant. And unless you do the routine examination, you can't establish. So any catatonia case, do the CK. And if it comes, about, comes back normal, then most likely it is just an ordinary catatonia. And if it is really raised, then then it is malignant catatonia. Drug screen of urine, urine drug screen. So you're seeing whether the uh, it is coming uh, from a kind of intoxication of drugs or not. Further investigation. So in patients with medical causes in which you can't find a mental disorder or you're not sure of the medical cause, then go for uh, ECG. I think ECG you have to do in routine. I would put it in, in the first line. Uh, because you do it with mental disorders anyway. And then CT brain would be further investigation, CT MRI, uh, echo, urine culture, blood culture, uh, tests for syphilis, HIV, heavy metal screen, autoantibody screen, and lumbar puncture. As for uh, NMS, where you don't know the cause. Treatment, where to treat? Ideally, all the patients should be treated in the hospital as inpatient not in the day hospital, but the hospital inpatient. Monitor vitals, monitor creatine kinase, and maybe FBC as well, and renal functions. And then monitor intake and output chart, because the patient most likely may stop eating or drinking. If that's the case, monitor intake and output. Uh, forced nutrition sometimes is required and you have to apply the Mental Health Act or Mental Capacity Act, depending on the cause. So the patient is seen by the uh, medics and the nutritionist in that case, and they advise you how to force nutrition them. And treatment of catatonia, so benzodiazepines. So normally we give up to four milligrams per day, but in catatonia, we may have to go even up to 24, uh, kind of uh, 24 milligrams per day of lorazepam. And it's not me saying whether, rather it's uh, the Morsley prescribing guidelines, which are saying first you have to rule out the NMS and then treat the NMS. And in NMS, you take a break, then you give the secondary, second generation antipsychotics and then you follow the benzodiazepines or ECT. But here in the primary catatonia, you first give the benzodiazepines. You can give uh, antipsychotics, some of the antipsychotics as well. But the first line is lorazepam. And you start with two milligrams BD, then there's no response. 
then you have to even go IM route if the patient is refusing oral. And if there is no response with four milligrams, you go to eight milligrams, then maybe uh, 12 milligrams, 16, and up to 24 milligrams oral or, or uh, even parenteral IM. Now, the main barrier we have is the licensing. And that, now, before I finish this, uh, and, the, and if there is no response, then you go to the ECT as a last resort. Now, the main barrier in giving high dose uh, lorazepam is uh the is the barrier of the uh, licensing so each country has its own laws or a book or guideline to follow in the britain you have to follow the british national formulary and bnf and similarly in pakistan uh, the good clinicians always follow the bnf and mostly prescribing guidelines in the UK, the licensing is through the MIMS, which is the equivalent of uh, BNF in Ireland. In the sorry, in Ireland, in Ireland, the equivalent of the uh, BNF is MIMS. And similarly, in the US, it will be FDA or Food and Drug Authority. You have to uh, go through this, uh, but unfortunately, BNF doesn't uh, indicate the uh, lorazepam for two things where the, it should have been indicated. So BNF says that uh, like it should be indicated in seclusion or rapid tranquilization, but BNF is quiet on that. Similarly, BNF is quiet on to when it comes to the uh, uh, kind of catatonia. What BNF indicates here is that it says severe panic attacks. So that means that you can use it for some indication. And in the BNF, the dose for the panic attacks, severe panic attacks could be PO or IM, 1.5 milligram to 2.5 milligrams every six hours. So that means that according to the BNF, uh, you can give 2.5 milligrams uh, four times a day. That means you can go up to 10 milligrams easily. But if you follow the mostly prescribing guidelines, it is up to 24 milligrams you can go. So what you do in the, under those circumstances, you mention in the documents that you are going unlicensed, but you are going according to the indication of the panic attacks. Same you do with the rapid tranquilization. Or, and then if you have to go even up, then uh, more than 10 milligrams, you'd say that you are following the mostly prescribing guidelines and there is no other option at the moment. And you have to go the above BNF recommendation. And then you can, although it will be still be unlicensed use. So now electroconvulsive therapy, can be there, can be performed. Mood stabilizers uh, can be used, carbamazepine. This is all from the mostly prescribing guidelines. Antipsychotics, NMDA antagonists, memantine, amantadine. Uh, and dopamine agonists, bromocriptine. Dantrolene if there is rigidity, like treat like uh, the NMS. Or sometimes you can see the uh, you can use the antipsychotics according to the mostly prescribing guidelines, especially olanzapine, and uh, because olanzapine is structurally very similar to benzodiazepine. And if you are using olanzapine uh, along with lorazepam, uh, make sure that the IM use is not within one hour of each other. One hour of each other. You give an IM lorazepam at eight o'clock. Do not give I am olanzapine for uh, until kind of nine o'clock at least, because otherwise there could be respiratory depression. And then the prognosis. Uh, so generally, there's a good prognosis of acute catatonia. However, it becomes cat uh, chronic, becomes difficult to treat. Depends on the cause, the prognosis. If it is, it comes from schizophrenia, of course, then prognosis 
may be good. I have seen uh, patients from schizophrenia, catatonic schizophrenia, coming out of catatonia and becoming fully responsive again. Uh, and similarly from depression, treat the depression and the psychotic symptoms. Complications, which may even lead to death, dehydration, renal failure, starvation, deep vein thrombosis, uh, and then sometimes if it is NMS, then respiratory paralysis and death and pulmonary embolism and death and harm to self and others because of the catatonic excitement. So these are my references uh, from advances in psychiatry treatment, which is called BJP uh, or BJ Psych advances, uh, Motsley prescribing guidelines, DSM-5, ICD-10 and Bush Francis catatonia uh, rating scale. So any questions and comments and I will go back to the uh, to the screen uh, stop sharing the screen now so any comments you can unmute uh, yes i'm dr dina still from the yes, hospital yes. i just so wanted to comment that it is uh, teacher thank you thank you so much you always remember uh, what i wanted to comment is that uh, because there at that time and even when book, books were written, they could, so uh, only a few treatments were available. Like these were mostly for the positive symptoms and negative symptoms are not treated that much, I mean, uh, in a bad good way. So uh, in residential care hospitals or long stay hospitals, we used to see these cases very often. But now, now we, even here in Pakistan, we, uh, for our students' sake, we rarely see such cases, and which, uh, mashallah, uh, Dr. Kamar, has described all the phenomenology so in a very very expressive way and uh, um, he has made you understand so good but now even here we see less cases because with so many treatment modalities available and even at that time prosopine was not available uh, now the patients are less in number which are having so many symptoms or such like a chronic disease. Thank you Dr. Kamran. You're very welcome. You have raised a good point. And even in the Motsley prescribing guidelines, clozapine is mentioned as one of the treatments. And of course, the mechanism of action is closer to benzodiazepine. So uh, then, yes, clozapine can be used. Thank you, madam. Any other questions from any resident trainees? Yes, sir. sir, basically, I'm, I was thinking of, you know, applying the ECT in case of catatonic. I mean, I have seen one patient when I was working in Mullingar, and uh, he presented in, in, a, in, a, in a catatonic manner. And later on, uh, he, I mean, of course, he was not drinking and eating. And, uh, and, and the, our residential care, the Mullingar Hospital, was a bit away from the regional hospital. So... At that stage, basically, we thought to uh, proceed directly to the uh, ECT instead of going, you know, through the typical guidelines like applying the lorazepam and wait and see the response. And I mean, I mean, what we saw, uh, I mean, in, in 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 basically a day or two, I mean, after one or two application of ECT, that patient was, I mean, fully recovered. I mean, that he was not having, you know, uh, that catatonic. Even he was not able to remember that. I mean, he was totally fine and he was doing very fine. And he, was, he even uh, never required ECT later on. I mean, only one or two applications of his were, uh, mm. uh, were basically, uh, they, they, they totally cured him. Yeah, so it's a very important point. So ECT response varies from patient to patient, person to person. So in your case, they they improved quite promptly in my london case when i was a senior reg uh, the patient improved quite promptly with the ect in my republic of ireland case which was in wicklow we had a patient i think he responded to around 12 courses of 12 sessions of ect and then my consultant i was a registrar at that time so my consultant decided to give him maintenance ect 
and uh, and uh, uh, like what we used to do in in his case is because he was so uh, uh, he had catatonic excitement and hitting out the members of the staff and other patients and slamming doors all these things were there we had to give him maintenance PT. Uh, for about two years we gave him uh, monthly and after two years we made it uh, we we stepped it down to two monthly and uh, uh, the last time I acted up for my consultant and uh, I remember that I was giving him uh, two monthly ECT I don't know what happened after that so it varies from uh, patient to patient. Patient to patient. But most of okay. the cases, as you say, may improve with two sessions or a, or a course of six sessions of uh, ECT and may not require ECT again because their compliance was poor previously. And once you improve the compliance, you start giving them depot injections, they, mm -hmm. they stay well. Thank you very much. Sir. You're welcome. Uh, any other? Question? Okay, so if there is no other question, then uh, we we conclude here. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, sorry, there was a disconnection. I will try to combine both the videos, or I will do a part one and part two, and upload it in the on the YouTube. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Thank you very much.